You're coming to Christmas, Lexor! The world's youngest professor, Soborno Isaac Bari, who is known as God of Mathematics. So what about equals mc squared? Well, to understand it, we have to go to its roots. Let's start with kinematics. So, in kinematics, there are some major concepts like force, work, energy, and momentum. So now, force is connected to work, of course, by W equals FD. You can, in fact, define work sort of as how much force is useful. So for example, if you have a box, you apply five newtons to it over two meters, then you've done 10 joules of work. But what happens if you use the same force to press that same box against the wall? You're using five newtons of force, but it's going zero meters. How much force is useful, not how much force is used. There was certainly force used here, but it's not useful. So the work done here is zero. So that's how we can define work. And so work is related to and work is related to force. And work is also related to energy by the work kinetic energy theorem. In fact, um, I think that uh, work kinetic energy equivalence or work energy equivalence, whatever. So um, we can prove this by equating F to MA, so W is, is MAD, then you can use, you can expand A by looking at the equation VF squared minus VI squared equals 2AD. Just divide both sides by 2D and voila. And so that gives you VF squared minus VI squared over 2D. Now you can cancel out this denominator and this guy over here, giving you W equals M. You can distribute over here, VF squared minus M VI squared over two. Now you can express that over two as one half. And so that gives you one half MVF squared minus one half MVI squared. And what do you think that would be, huh? Hmm, this looks familiar. W equals KEF minus KEI. Or in other words, work is the change in kinetic energy. And so, now let's go to the relation between force and mass. The relation between force and mass, um, let's just draw this over here. The relation between force and momentum, I mean. So what is momentum first? Well, let's say you have a truck that's going at 30 miles per hour and a baseball that's going at 30 miles per hour. Now one will straight up kill you and the other will severely injure you. But there's a difference between the two. And so the difference is that the truck has more mass while the baseball has less mass. And so, the momentum is basically how hard it is to make something stop moving, according to Newton's first law, at least. How, uh, let me just speed write, how hard it is to make something stop moving. All right, so now we have to relate P to E. Oh wait, but I didn't relate P to F yet. <gasps> oh my God. Well, F is just MA. And we know that A is the change in velocity over time. And so that gives us F equals M delta V over T which is just the change in can uh, which is just the change in momentum over time or if you're a fancy guy f equals minus dp over dt this one is just for calculators and so uh, and this it's a change in p over t but anyway um that gives us f equals 
delta p over t. All right. And so now it's pretty clear how p would be related to e. But can we do it? Yes, of course we can. What we do is f equals delta p over t, giving us delta, uh, delta p d over t. But this just equates to velocity. So f d is work that just gets you delta p delta k e. So you get this. And then you finally get delta p equals delta k e over v. Now, let's adjust this to our likings. Now, we will be talking about a moving body, but just for convenience, uh, and the sake of convenience, we'll just reduce k delta k e to e. Let's also remove the delta from p. And we are, we're talking about a photon. And so it will be traveling at light speed. So now we get P equals E over C. For normal objects, uh, we were doing classical stuff, so this doesn't uh, appear. But for in relativity, for normal objects, there would be an effect of relativistic mass. But nobody cares about that because we're talking about photons, and photons have no rest mass. And so that is... Well, so now we finally have P is equal to E over C. So now what to do with that? Well, what we will do with P equals E over C is, as I said, we're talking about a container. And so let's say it's in just a void and there's a light source and this light source emits a wave. And so and recoils because of the wave. And so now, this is how it looks like. And so, kind of just recoils back due to the conservation of momentum. Kind of like how when you fire a gun from a bullet, this is just my rudimentary drawing of a gun. Thankfully, I do know how to draw a gun. Well, maybe that's not for the better, but um, this is just my, my uh, how do I describe it? And so, this is, so when a gun fires a bullet, which, so when a gun fires a bullet, then that means that and it will recoil due to the conservation of momentum. And so we can't violate the conservation of momentum. And so we also know that to, it's if this is in a forceless void, then there must then there must be some other reason for this thing recoiling. And so that reason must be the light, since there's nothing else. And so, uh, the light must have mass. Why? Because Newton's first law says that nothing will move if a force uh, doesn't act on it. And so, that means that, um, for example, um, God, no forces, at least not to my knowledge, are acting over here. Um, possibly, uh, at least the sum of all forces is uh, zero, so the, for the net force is zero, and so that's sort of the situation over here as well. So this must recoil due to a force. According to Newton's second law, force can only come with a mass, so the light must be emitting that mass. And for now, we'll call that light emitting mass, uh, that mass that's been emitted by the light, little m. And we'll call the mass of the container big M. All right. And so now we get uh, now we get two sections to this. So first, let's use the equation we had before. And this might be a bit uh, of cheating, but p equals mc. E over c equals mc squared, baby! Okay, yeah, of course that's not how it works. It's so sad. But we must accept the truth. This is, oh geez, m v, v is delta x over delta t, e over c. So delta x, what would 
delta x mean? Well, delta x is the change in position of the container. So let's call this delta x. And so, this gives us um, m delta x over what was delta t? Well, delta t is the time that has passed. Uh, the time that passes, uh, it starts when the light is emitted and ends when the light gets to the wall. And so it's L divided by C equals E over C. So now both, uh, multiply both sides by um, L over C and you get M delta X is equal to E L over C squared. Doesn't look promising so far, but I promise it gets better. All right. So now the second thing we'll do is to get rid of this pesky term, we need to find the center of mass. And so this will likely be one of the components in the center of mass. So let's just get to it. So the center of mass is basically done by taking the mass of the mass of this guy, the position of it, and then takes the mass of other objects inside it, takes the position of them, and that's how you find, uh, um, that's how you find the center of mass. And so, now what objects are in here mm. well, that have mass? Well, there's the light, which technically must emit some mass, a mass that we call n, little n, then big mass of the container, big M. And so now, we get um, little n, um, actually big M, x1, we'll term x1 to be the center, the container, and then we have minus little m, x2, we'll define x2 as being the light detector, and then divide that by big M plus little m. Uh, sorry, I switched it up, and that gives you the initial center of mass. <gasps> but what about the final center of mass? Well, the only thing that changes is the position. And so that gets us M. The position of the container has changed by delta X minus M. The position of light has changed by L, so X2 plus L. Divide that by m plus m. But according to Newton, the center of mass cannot change. So we set these equal to each other, and right away we can cancel out this denominator, giving us mx1 minus mx2 is equal to, let's distribute mx1, m delta x, and then uh, I probably sort of made clear that this was actually the container mass, sorry. And so, that gives us, um, then minus m and little m times x2, and then little m uh, times l, uh, we distribute the minus as well, and so now, you just cancel out the equivalent terms. Oopsies. You get mm, zero equals to m delta x minus ml. m delta x is equal to ml. And so now that means we can plug in and we get ml equals el over c squared. We cancel out on both sides, boom, boom. We get m equals e over c squared. After some rearranging, we get e equals mc squared. Woo! Brought to you by Brilliant.org. The Bari Science Lab to fall in love with math and science.